Hello, my name is Duncan Kitts, and today I'll be doing a presentation on the exciting new subgrid sampling functionality that was added to the 2020 release of TwoFlow. This short presentation will explain what subgrid sampling is and how it can be applied within TwoFlow. I'll discuss the benefits of using subgrid sampling, as well as a few considerations that need to be undertaken when utilizing the functionality within your modeling. Before introducing subgrid sampling, let's first consider how TwoFlow schematizes the cell geometry. TwoFlow samples a point at the center of the cell, the ZC point, which determines the cell volume and storage. TwoFlow also samples points at the cell sides, ZU and ZV points. Not all 2D solvers do this. The elevations of the cell center point and the cell side point are sampled from the underlying DTM or the tin. And this provides a flat bottom cell from which the cell volume is based and a rectangular faces to adjacent cells on which velocity and flow is based. This approach works well if the model cell size is at a size which sufficiently represents the underlying topographic variation. This slide shows the traditional cell schematization with a cell volume elevation point at the center of the cell and four cell face elevation points on each of the faces. And this provides us with our flat bottom cell and the rectangular faces into adjacent cells. However, we can quite clearly see that in this instance, the topography of the open channel is clearly not particularly well represented. And we've got our cell center point there just picking up the very edge of the, uh, the riverbank. With the subgrid sampling approach, we sample the underlying topography available within the DTM or the TIN, and from this we develop nonlinear cell volume versus elevation curves, and also cell face width versus elevation curves. And this means that the bottom of the cell is no longer flat, we're representing the full channel bathymetry, and our cell faces are more akin to irregular cross sections rather than the rectangular cross sections of the traditional approach. We'll now look at how to set up subgrid sampling to be used within a two-flow model. So the first thing to note is that subgrid sampling is currently only available with the two-flow HPC solver. It is not currently available with the two-flow classic solver. Subgrid sampling is, however, compatible with the new quad tree functionality that was released as part of the 2020 version of two-flow. Therefore, within our TCF file, our two-flow control file, we need to specify the solution scheme equals equals HPC option. Once this is added, to use subgrid sampling, we simply add the SGS equals equals on command to the TCF. By de default for grids, TwoFlow will sample at the DTM resolution. However, this can be controlled by the user by using the SGS sample distance within the TwoFlow geometry control file, the TGC file. The sample distance provides the interval in meters or feet that the DTM elevation is sampled. The sample distance command is currently mandatory for TIN datasets, and the command can be used any number of times to control the sampling distance for individual topographic data sources. Note that there are some changes for the 2020 10 AB release underway, which may supersede the use of this option. To find out more, I would recommend referring to the release notes upon the release of the 2020 10 AB version. With these commands being made, subgrid sampling will be used in the two-flow simulation, sampling the underlying topography as part of the model processing stage. There are three main ben benefits to the use of subgrid sampling. The first is the improved topographic representation when using mesh cell sizes larger than the DTM cell size. So for example, in this example, we have high resolution topographic data for the floodplain, but we also have high resolution topographic data for the river channel. Traditionally, we may have used 1D cross sections to represent this. However, such an approach requires time consuming model schematization. Nonetheless, we undertook this and we modeled a particular event, which shows that the flows are constrained to the main channel. We may, however, want to represent as a 2D only simulation which typically requires less model build time and fewer assumptions in the hydraulic modeling approach. However, with the traditional cell scheme schematization, we would need a model cell size equal to the DTM cell size to pick up the available topographic detail within the river channel. These 
the, the kind of cell sizes we'd need for this can be can lead to time consuming simulations. With a cell size larger than the TTM cell size, the simulation can be quicker, but we end up averaging the topography, reducing the amount of storage available, and we end up with unrealistic results such as the image here, which shows water on the floodplain for the same event that we just showed as being within the channel. With subgrid sampling, we can utilize the same 2D cell size as before, the same speed of simulation, but still represent the topographic detail. By doing so, we represent that topographic detail within the channel correctly, we better represent the channel capacity, and we get results more in line with what we would expect and match the 1D results. These three images show a small area of the model topography from the model shown in the previous slides. The image on the left is the raw topographic data, and we can see the detail that's present within that data set, with the channel being picked out, and also the top of the embankments. The middle image shows the schematization that a 2D solver using a 20 meter cell size and a traditional cell schematization would see. The channel width is underestimated, the channel capacity reduced, and the embankment heights lessened by the averaging that takes place. The image on the right shows the detail represented by the 20 meter grid when using subgrid sampling, and we can see it's a much better representation of the raw topography, representing the true capacity of the channel. As well as a better representation of the underlying topography, subgrid sampling also provides a better representation of the wet dry boundary. So this is output from a theoretical rectangular cross section model with a high velocity of one meters per second. It's possible to calculate the expected water level and energy grade line, and these are represented by the red traces. If we have a model where the grid is perfectly aligned with the banks of the channel, we can represent the hydraulics very well and match the theoretical outputs. The model outputs are shown in blue there. If we start to misalign the mesh, we start to distort the streamlines. And the reason for this is that as we only have one elevation value per cell, the cell can only be wet or dry. And this means we get a sawtooth effect at the wet dry boundary. And this can lead to the generation of artificial head losses and we diverge from the theoretical outputs. If we misalign further, we get further divergence. And then when we get to a 45 degree misalignment, we get less of a sawtooth effect and we start to converge on the theoretical output again. And this shows that with the traditional output, there are some sensitivities to mesh orientation, uh, which can be quite significant when we have higher velocities. However, if we use upward sampling, our cells can be partially wet and we better represent the wet dry boundary. And this means that we don't have the same sawtooth effect. We don't introduce uh, artificial head losses. We don't distort the streamlines and our results don't appear to be sensitive to the mesh orientation. The third benefit is the reduced sensitivity to mesh size. So this is the same model was shown previously using the 30, de 30 degree misalignment case. And we've used a 50 meter cell size here, which provides one to two grid cells across the width of the channel. As you can see, the simulation output in gray does not correspond particularly well with the theoretical output in red. And again, this is due to that source tooth effect at the wet dry boundary. If we start to reduce the cell size, we get better model outputs, which begin to match what we would expect theoretically. Until we converge to what we would expect based on Manning's principles. Nonetheless, our results do show some mesh dependency. With subgrid sampling, we better represent that wet dry boundary. And if we start with a fine cell size, we again match theoretically expected outputs. But as we coarsen the cell size, we still get a very good match, even at a 50 meter cell size. And the reason for this is subgrid sampling. To take this one step further, this is output from a direct rainfall model from Wales in the United Kingdom. We have a multi-peaked rainfall event and we've got a gauge at the bottom of the catchment and the observed flow hydrograph is shown uh, in pink there. If we use a 40 meter cell size, our model output using the traditional cell schematizing, schematization approach isn't particularly great. However, we can improve the model output by reducing the cell size. 
So I will now flick through um, a number of slides which show the outputs from a range of grid cell sizes. And we will start to see that the results converge on the observed flow hydrograph. This shows again the mesh dependency of the results. With subgrid sampling, we get the same great match with a small cell size, but we also get good matches as I scroll through and increase the cell size. Even at the 40 meter cell size. So we appear to have eliminated the mesh dependency of the results to the point where results are pretty independent of the mesh size. And what this allows us to do is to use larger mesh sizes, which run quicker. And what we can do here is we can utilize subgrid sampling with a coarser grid size to get through perhaps a larger number of calibration runs and then potentially refine the grid size for flood mapping, confident that our outputs are still going to be the same as the calibration exercise. We can also run longer time series, run in, uh, quicker simulations for flood forecasting, and we can also test more mitigation options. All in all, it increases our confidence in our model outputs. So there are three main benefits of subgrid sampling. It improves the representation of the underlying topography, it eliminates sensitivity to mesh orientation, and it reduces sensitivity to the mesh size. When using subgrid sampling in your models, there are a couple of things to consider. Firstly, there is no benefit to using subgrid sampling if the two flow mesh size is similar to the DTM cell size. In this case, the mesh is picking up the large majority of the topographic detail available within the DTM. However, if the grid size is greater than the resolution of the DTM, then any topographic features, whether they be open channels, embankments, buildings, if they're present within the DTM, they will be represented within the hydraulic model, regardless of the grid size. Secondly, subgrid sampling isn't a grid within the cell. It just parameterizes the underlying topography. As such, subgrid sampling does not know if the higher elevations within the cell form a barrier to flow traveling between one side of the cell to the other. Therefore, for embankments and other barriers to flow, you would want to ensure the embankment ridge is being picked up by using Z-shaped ridge max lines to avoid leaky embankments. We'll be putting some tools into the next release of TwoFlow to allow you to identify where these leaky embankments may occur. Where the DTM is fine enough to pick up gullies, uh, channels and other low points, subgrid sampling can pick up these and represent them within the hydraulic model and preserve these uh, flow paths without using any uh, gully min lines. In such a case, using a gully min line may misrepresent the width of the flow path, which is better represented by subgrid sampling. Therefore, we would generally recommend avoiding the use of Z-shaped gully min lines, although there are still some situations where they may be of use. Finally, consider the mapping outputs. As mentioned previously, with subgrid sampling, a cell can be partially wet. Therefore, the user needs to consider at what point the cell is considered wet for mapping purposes. TwoFlow has a number of options in terms of when to consider a cell as wet in terms of mapping. It could be as soon as the lower cell, is, cell elevation is wet, or when the average cell elevation is wet, or when a certain percentile of the cell ele elevations are wet. There's a number of different options. I would recommend reviewing the release notes to find out more. The default option is not always the most appropriate, so the modeler should consider the mapping requirements for the specific study at hand. There are also some high resolution mapping output options available, which remap the hydraulic results onto the DTM at the DTM resolution. These are currently external tools on our website, but they will be implemented within the TwoFlow engine for the next release. So to summarize, subgrid sampling is exciting new functionality uh, that was made available within the 2020 release of TwoFlow, specifically the TwoFlow HPC solver. It is also compatible with the TwoFlow Quadtree functionality that was also released as part of the 2020 uh, release of TwoFlow. Subgrid sampling is very simple and easy to implement within the software. It's just a single command in most instances, and its benefits are wide ranging from improved topographic representation to significantly reduced sensitivity to mesh orientation and also to mesh size. When applying subgrid sampling to your uh, study area, there are a couple of things to consider. Uh, you should consider the representation of topographic features such as embankments 
which may block flow, and also consider the map output requirements at the beginning of the study. Thanks for listening to this presentation. I hope you found it useful and happy modeling.